Okay, can I call a meeting to order and can I welcome everyone to this, the fifth meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2019. We have one item on the agenda this morning, which is consideration of five continued petitions. The first petition is Petition 1711, lodged by Stuart Callison on behalf of St Andrew's First Aid. The petition calls for basic first aid to be included as an integral part of the primary school curriculum and calls for funding to be provided to develop high quality teaching materials and to establish training to allow primary school teachers to deliver the training. Mr Callison is the Chief Executive of St Andrew's First Aid and he's going to give evidence to the committee this morning alongside his colleague Francis Stewart. Also in the panel, we have Colin Peebles, who is a teacher at Mearns Primary School in Glasgow. And I'm also absolutely delighted to welcome some young people who will be giving evidence this morning. And actually, we've already experienced these young pupils ex demonstrating their skills and probably the best start to a committee we've had in a long time. So thank you very much indeed. And um, we did that informally before the meeting. So I want to welcome Rebecca Russell, who's a student at Glasgow City College, and Ellie Meek and Millie Robinson, who are pupils at Parkhead Primary School in West Calder. And I want to welcome you very much today to get the opportunity to talk about um, why you think the petition is so important. Um, so welcome to you all, and can I invite uh, Mr Callison to provide a brief opening statement of up to no more than five minutes, after which we'll move to questions from the committee. Good morning, convener, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here on behalf of St Andrew's First Aid, one of Scotland's oldest charities and the only dedicated first char aid charity in Scotland. We're asking this morning the committee to urge the Scottish Government to do more to promote basic first aid as part of the curriculum in all Scottish primary schools. The Curriculum for Excellence does, of course, provide scope for this. For example, one of the outcomes is that children should know and be able to demonstrate how to keep themselves and others safe and how to respond in an emergency. But as things stand, it's very much down to every individual local authority whether or not these essential skills are taught to pupils. Um, and in practice, first aid learning does depend heavily on the knowledge and enthusiasm of individual teachers, such as Mr Peebles. Scotland's Information Services Division recently highlighted the stark fact that those living in the most deprived areas of the country have a death rate from heart disease six times higher than their wealthier neighbours, a 36% more likely to die from a stroke. Youngsters living in these areas are more likely to encounter violence or health issues arising from the misuse of drugs and alcohol. Yet children in these areas are far less likely to learn first aid in their schools or through membership of youth organisations such as the Cubs and Brownies. We believe that if children and young adults are equipped with these skills at an early age, they'll become lifelong advocates of first aid and make a huge difference within their families and their local community. Our plans are calling for the provision of high quality and age appropriate teaching materials, as well as training and support to enable teachers to deliver first aid knowledge to their pupils in short focused work workshops, integrated into the curriculum in the way that they see fit. We know that children can benefit, our young people have demonstrated this morning, from an understanding of what to do when someone is choking, how to put them in the recovery position and perform CPR, some basic bandaging for wounds, and even how to recognise and help when one of their classmates is anxious or distressed, so-called mental health first aid. I want to note in passing that we do, of course, actively support uh, the campaign by the British Heart Foundation and the Scottish Government to promote the teaching of CPR. But vital though that is, it is only one of a the, you know, the set of basic first aid skills. This is a modest measure, financially speaking, with significant societal benefits. We fully recognise the pressures of time and resources already facing our schools and have designed this approach to be a cost-effective value-for-money solution. We're proposing to develop high-quality teaching tools to make the job easier for people like Colin. There are, of course, many of these scattered around the internet. We can all find them. But nothing very comprehensive, nothing tailored to the curriculum for excellence, uh, and indeed some of them probably not really appropriate for, for primary schools. Developing materials in conjunction with Scottish teachers themselves we believe would be beneficial. Again, we would teach, we propose to teach one teacher in each school, train one teacher in each school to cascade that learning down through um, their, their schools and through the local authority area. And we calculate that implementing a first aid training program in schools on these lines would not cost much more than half a million pounds in the first year, falling thereafter, the equivalent of around 270 pounds per primary school. And in the longer term, if first aid education were to be included in initial teacher training, this would also reduce the CPD burden on schools and take the cost down further. 
The benefits to society outweigh such a modest investment by increasing, first of all, the number of trained bystanders ready to help in an emergency. Even at an early age, children are receptive to first aid training uh, and keen to share their knowledge with family and friends. And when the Danes introduced a, a similar program in the early 2000s, in a 10-year period, they increased the number of bystander interventions from around 20% of emergency situations to over 70%, largely because kids were going home and telling mum, dad, uncles, cousins, and the rest, and showing them what to do. Um, teaching first aid in schools is very inclusive, can, uh, appropriate for all levels of um, development, all, all races, colours, and creeds. Researchers have noted that first aid training contributes to increased confidence and self-esteem in young people. And the, the, the people we have here this morning, I think, are the, the, the perfect uh, ones to speak to that. As a skill for life, first aid training also can help young people to be more risk averse, uh, particularly um, the consequences of binge drinking and drug use, specific areas where it's shown that teachers, who, uh, that teenagers, sorry, who understand the risks involved are less likely to get involved themselves, and they're also able to help their friends when they get into trouble. Simply knowing how to put somebody into the recovery position, for example, can be enough to save a life in these situations. And finally, the committee may be aware that the Westminster government announced in July 2018 that first aid training would form part of compulsory health education in all English schools from 2020 onwards, in the belief that this will support academic attainment and school performance, and that disadvantaged pupils would see the most benefit. And in this instance, we do believe that Scotland could benefit from following suit. Um, thank you, and um, thank we'd you be happy to take any that. questions. We'll start off with some questions, but I think we're probably particularly keen to hear about the experiences of the young people who are involved, and also, obviously, Francis, who's involved in a lot of training, and um, our, our, our primary uh, teacher. But just, I'll be asked a couple of questions, and I'll ask my uh, colleagues to ask some questions, but please feel free to direct the questions to the person in the panel you think might be most able to, to answer. I suppose you may be... Um, highlighted this already in what you said, but you can just confirm why you would start with primary as opposed to other parts of the education system, and why specifically would you start with um, schools in, in areas of high deprivation? Could I perhaps ask my colleagues who have been teaching to contribute to this point? In regards to starting it further down in primary school, younger children are more malleable, they are more receptive to new things, they're keen to learn, they're the proverbial spongy soaking up knowledge. So I think starting it earlier rather than later is a fantastic idea. Um, as I, as um, Stuart's already said, the, the bystander effect is reduced. If people just have a little bit of knowledge, then, as Stuart's already said again about the recovery position, knowing little things that they'll take further on and they can build in these skills as they go through. So, for example, in our school, we start them in nursery school, um, primary one, with very, very basic things, things like knowing about the emergency services, recognising risk, and that progresses through the school to CPR and the recovery position by the time they get to the senior school. I can't talk for my secondary colleagues, but um, that's certainly why I would... Um, advocate for so earlier. primary schools, are, would you regard yourself as unusual in having such a kind of thought through programme right from the earliest stages? Would we regard ourselves as unusual? Again, I can't speak for other schools. I know that um, first, I think what Stuart's recommending is two hours per year. We do 12 hours per year at the moment. Uh, we had a working party last year that we decided we wanted to focus on life skills. And when you're teaching things like, like, be it first aid, be it cooking skills, be it design and technology, you've got very mixed ability classes. It's very much a level playing field. Um, and then for it, for children who come from more deprived areas as well, as already has already been mentioned, they're probably more likely to experience something that may well be a medical emergency. So having that um, knowledge earlier is a great thing. OK, thank you. Uh, Brian Whittle. Um, thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning. Uh, so welcome uh, here at Curtis here, particularly to Millie and Ellie. I think uh, you were fantastic this morning. You've uh, made an, um, an old man feel much better. And, uh, <coughs> and I think everybody should have a Millie or an Ellie close by. That's why <laughs> I certainly would like one. Um, 
we're, we are uh, aware, of course, that uh, uh, these first aid skills are taught in a uniform section. Um, you know, the, the, the beavers or cubs or guides or, or scouts or whatever. Um, which means that children as young as six years old uh, in the beaver section um, acquire them as life skills. Uh, is this, and I take it this is, uh, that, that, that young age there is still something you think should be mirrored in schools? The area has a beavers or a cubs or a scouts or whatever it might be. So everybody, most children in every area will go to school. Not every child, child will go to one of these clubs. So you can do a catch-all in a school as opposed to maybe a quarter, a fifth, whatever the numbers might be in clubs. Yeah. So, I, I was just going to say, I think the, the merits of having a, a focused approach in all schools is that everyone will learn. There are absolutely some outstanding examples in Scottish schools where first aid is taught. We'd like everybody to have that opportunity. Perhaps, I mean, Rebecca is one of our most active recruiters of young people. Perhaps I could ask her to, to comment as well. Yes, so my name's Rebecca. Um, I'm with Stanley Company with St Andrews. Um, we started off the year last year in September with only two cadets that came back over the summer. So me and my friend Cara took it upon ourselves to go around our local primary and high schools. So that was schools such as Hillington, Ross Hall, and we had ties in with them because we used to go there. So we went around all these schools, done a wee demonstration, spoke a bit about what it's like to be a cadet, and we had an opening day for them, and we had 19 cadets come out of that which we were really proud of and really happy. And we did go back very occasionally to go to Ross Hall and spoke to the kids that we went and done the talks to. And they were really enthusiastic about the first aid and they were saying how they would love it to be taught as they want to learn more. So we get more out of that than just basically knowing what we know and how we're putting it on to the kids. And the kids, the kids we have at the cadets, the youngest is nine, the oldest is 16, and they come every single week and they love it. They absolutely love it. Okay. Thank you. I, mean, I, I, mean, I have to say, uh, I can still remember as far back as uh, uh, primary school when uh, we, we, we did some CPR um, um, but, but it, I think it was primary six or primary seven. So I'm just interested, is, is your suggestion that we start as soon as they come in or, or, we, are we, or, or it's something that, that comes in later on in, within the primary school? What, where do you think uh, the, the point is? I think that um, all materials that we would produce would be age appropriate. But it is possible for children to be introduced to the concepts at, right from primary one and primary two onwards. Um, even if it is something as simple as knowing how to f get help in an emergency if mummy or daddy has collapsed. Situations which have arisen and where kids who have been aware of uh, basic first aid have successfully been able to call for help as young as four or five. I know that there have been um, some primary schools in the, I think it's in Edinburgh, where they've introduced CPR as young as five or six. Now at that age, Children aren't going to have the physical strength, really, to do it. But they're being introduced to the concept. And the introduction of those concepts that's demonstrated lasts longer if you start younger. You, of course, a five-year-old probably won't be able to do effective CPR. However, they're far more likely to refresh those skills when they go on to secondary school and in later life. So, yes, we would propose to have age-appropriate teaching available for classes right the way through the school. Yeah, I think it's important to note that first aid, if it becomes normal, and inverted commas, at an early age, then it stays normal. It doesn't become something that someone has collapsed over there or I'll pretend I didn't see that, which unfortunately is the case in some cases. If you have started to get that knowledge and that confidence in it at an earlier age, and as Stuart said, CPR fed by a five-year-old may not be effective, but if they are aware of the motion and what that might be, and as they become bigger and stronger and are able to continue these skills on, then to me that's a great thing. Could I just a short I wanted to ask uh, Millie and Ellie, because uh, I'm trying to get you back for hurting me so much. Um, I want to ask, 
Melanie, do you, do you feel confident enough to, to, to maybe teach your classmates these skills? Uh, you, you tried to teach me these skills and I was terrible. But do you feel confident enough that you could, you could take the skills that you know and then teach them to your classmates? Um, I'd done a three-minute talk in my class before um, and, and I got my youth leader to bring in the dummy um, and I'd done a demonstration of it and I told them why I do first aid. So I taught my class it. How did your classmates uh, react to that? Um, I think they learned something from it. Great. That's super. Okay. Um, Francis, you were nodding when we were talking about the training. I wonder if you want to say something about the training that you do. Well, if I just touch on something that the guys have already said as well. One of the I've worked in first aid for many years now, across from very young right across to workplace courses as well. One of the biggest barriers to anybody helping out if someone takes ill in the street is fear. People don't know what to do. They're frightened to do something wrong. See, the younger a child is, and the more you get them used to it, even if it is they see a dummy on the floor and they therefore know how to touch it, know what that feels like, know what the depth is. These kind of things mean that they don't have that fear anymore. I've got a son who's just about to be two. Now, he can't do CPR. I'm not saying that, right? However, he knows what a dummy looks like. See, when he gets older, he's not going to be frightened of that then because he already has an awareness of what mum does. He already has an awareness of how to help somebody because he's seen me doing that. If we can get rid of the fear early on, that means it's far easier as they get older when they're going through things. If you get them early on and you say to them, right, well, if you see someone lying on the floor, all you need to do is call for help. You get them to call her in an ambulance and it's got 999 wrote on it. They're not frightened of that as they get older and then it becomes like building blocks. You then just have to keep reintroducing things. You don't need to start from scratch again. As I say, when I'm out training, I've trained primary ones, so it is proper training. It's not that you're just going in and you're just talking to them. You're taking them through things. You're showing them that they can do such massive things, even though they are so small. They are people who they can be shaped into this thing. We want to make sure that nobody is frightened, even over and asking if somebody needs help. They don't need to know everything. They don't even need to remember all of the training. They just need to know that they can go over and they can do something. And doing no first aid is much worse than going in and having a shot. So you need to go and you need to try. You need to be able to have that lack of not being terrified to do something. And the younger someone is, the better chance you've got to shape them to being able to be first aiders as they grow bigger. OK. Um, I wonder if Rebecca wants to say something about her experience. Because I think one of the things that struck the committee was that, that this is a skill that literally saves lives, which is just an amazing skill to have. Um, and an amazingly important skill for people to have. And I know that you, you spoke earlier and informally about things you've been involved in, and I wonder if you wanted to share that with the committee. Yes, so last year, uh, I was standing, I just came out of a gig in, in the town, on Jamaica Street, and there was a young girl, just a year or so younger than me, who was unconscious on the ground. So her friends informed me that she had a fit and she was going in and out of consciousness. So my first instinct was to go in, put her in a cup position, keep her warm because it was damp, it had been raining, and to keep her calm and to keep her talking to somebody, whether that's her friend or to me, just so she can keep her awareness of what's going on around her. We phoned an ambulance as well, and we, the girl was fine. She, we actually met up a couple of weeks ago, and she, is, she was very grateful by just someone helping her, whether that was somebody like out in the public or, it was, or one of her friends. She was just grateful that somebody, she knew somebody was there looking after her. And then a couple of months back, I was on my way to my cadet class and I just came out of college and I was walking to get the bus and there was an older man lying on the ground that fell onto the road. Um, there was people around and the first thing we done was put him in recovery position and kept him talking. His wife was there so the wife was really helpful. She knew what was going on. 
Uh, she kept speaking to him, making sure he was okay. Uh, we waited for the ambulance and kept him in a car position to keep him stable and to keep him comfy as well. And he made a good recovery as well. So I think as well, I, like the, my colleague said, that it's at a young age, you could be frightened. It's something new to you, seeing someone just lying on the ground. And for me, if I wasn't used to first aid, I would still be what, what's happened. I would be a bit unsteady going towards them. But getting kids at a young age could save someone's life as well. They, will, they won't be as scared to go up to someone if they know what to do, even if that is just to phone 999 or get someone older to help. If they know the basics, then it means we know that person's going to be safe. It's very much what strikes me about that is your confidence gave other people confidence round about you. And you're saying that young people might feel unconfident. I wouldn't qualify as a young person for a very long time. And I would still, even thinking about that, that uncertainty, lack of confidence, that that's having somebody who knows what they're doing can make a huge difference. Can I ask Angus to come in? OK, <coughs> thanks, um, convener. Um, this is a great evidence session so far. It's, it's so good to, to hear um, ex ex some uh, prime examples of, of, of how it's been going so far. But can I just, uh, I'd like um, to place on record um, um, an issue that I have uh, in, in my local authority. Um, and I'd like to name and shame my local authority, uh, Falkirk Council, who are only one of three local authorities who haven't uh, signed up yet to the British Heart Foundation scheme. Uh, of, of CPR training in secondary schools, uh, despite my cajoling uh, since last August. So um, I clearly welcome this, uh, this initiative and, and this petition. Um, we can clearly see the benefits of it being, being introduced at primary level. Um, and uh, clearly, if, we, if, if it's introduced at primary level, we're not going to have the issue uh, at, uh, at secondary level. So um, I, I was wondering if, if you could maybe expand on uh, Mr. Callison, the, 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 the initial cost that you were talking about in the first year of, of, of half a million pounds um, for training teachers, uh, one teacher in each school. Um, there's, uh, you know, clearly an issue to access to training and, and materials. So would you envisage that half a million covering the materials as well, or would that? Yes. Who would yes. Um, we are, of course, conscious of uh, our austerity-driven times. Uh, and that local authorities don't have money to throw around, and also that schools are already very busy. The cost would cover um, the preparation of materials that teachers themselves will be able to draw down and take off the shelf. Uh, without too much preparation time, it would be age appropriate, it would be um, designed to be user friendly, and to do that we would absolutely wish to work with teachers themselves, because we are not educationalists, we're first aiders. Um, so I would absolutely see this being a, a collaborative approach. We've written recently, for example, to the EIS asking them for their support, and I would certainly want them to, to be involved. It would co cover the staff costs, whether it was ourselves or somebody else, of actually providing a uh, training uh, for teachers from a particular local authority on the basis that those good skills can be cascaded down through other teachers. So schools don't need to send a whole lot of staff. We don't need to have an endless number of, of training courses. Teachers can pick this up and share it with their colleagues, and my, my colleague Francis might want to, to add to that. Uh, and then you have the costs of the equipment, some of which you've seen. The, the mannequins um, don't last forever, but they do have a reasonable lifetime if looked after. Um, so they'll last for a number of years. So the initial cost is higher because of the capital investment and equipment. Then afterwards you have the costs of keeping the things clean and sterile and so forth. And really, unless Francis is going to correct me, I think that is pretty much it. That is what this proposal involves. Um, as I say, a modest measure which can, financially speaking, which can produce significant benefits. But Francis, I think you, you've actually done some of the peer yeah. training and maybe add to, to that answer. So. Uh, 
as Stuart says, we're very conscious that the school, well, everywhere is under intense financial pressure already, and obviously the schools as well are under a lot of pressure to already meet their targets. We certainly don't want to introduce something which is going to be more difficult for them to then actually carry it through. We want to work together. We want to make it that, as these guys have already said, like, our guys are so lucky, our kids are lucky, they've came to the cadets, we've got the brownies and stuff like that. We want to make it that it's not sporadic, we want to make it that it's inclusive and every child is getting the chance to this very basic training. So we then want to back that up with a proposal that's going to make sure that the schools are able to do it without being under intense financial or other pressure. So when we costed this up, we costed up to have the downloadable resources. So even if we were to start small, it would be downloadable resources and then as it would grow, we would have an online portal that would then have ability to chat back and forward as well, everything that would be able to, if they, they, I've been a trainer for years teaching first aid, they're obviously teachers can teach in everything that they do already, but if they start getting a wee bit kind of frightened about what they're delivering first aid wise, we'll be there to support them through this online portal. We've also included a starter pack, which will be bandages, wipes, all that kind of thing, everything that will enable them to carry this training out. And as Stuart says, we've costed up for mannequins to be there for the school to have. So that will become theirs and they will then have to, yes, upkeep it, but as long as the mannequins are looked after, they can last for years. That will then allow them to use this as and when they need it within their school day, whether they do do it for two hours or, as Colin says, whether they decide to do it for more. But the resources that we give them, that will enable them to do this completely and be sustainable in their delivery with the Adam Reach help from us, basically. OK, great, thanks. Um, Rachel Hamilton. Convener. Um, it's a question really to Colin, and then I'm going to come across uh, to the girls. But um, through your experience, um, how would you encourage uh, teachers to integrate the skills uh, that, that you've learned into the curriculum itself? In the actual curriculum itself, there are experiences and outcomes which I'm sure you're aware of and if I, I say a few of them health and well-being 215a I am developing understanding of the body and can use this to maintain and improve my well-being and health 216a I am learning to assess and manage risk and to protect myself and others and to reduce the potential for harm when possible 217a I know and can demonstrate how to keep myself and others safe and how to respond in a range of emergency situations now that that becomes more complex as you go through the, the primary school you're through your primary school career but it's more or less the same throughout the school only it becomes harder so it's already there we actually kind of already are doing it we don't have dedicated mannequins and first aid providers within the school personally i have a first aid qualification and i'm happy to do it and as i say we're working part in our school we sat down and said what are the things the, li the main life skills that we want these children to leave school with and first aid and emergency management was one of the ones that we wanted to do so teachers would be fantastic to have an off-the-shelf resource we make up our own resources and schools and teachers who know each other in different schools share resources but to, to have an off-the-shelf resource which is prepared by experts in conjunction with teachers personally i think it's an excellent idea thank you um thank you as well um i just want to put on record my thanks and um your confidence and and your calmness is incredible and i would have felt really confident if i'd had to uh, do CPR with you next to me but I'll take that away and I'll always remember that if it does come to that and uh, I know Joanne Lamont our convener here she's trained all her staff uh, in CPR first aid training and I'm going to think about doing that for my team as well so thank you for enthusing and inspiring us uh, today so I'm, I'm going to ask you a question how do you think that you could encourage other teachers in Scotland because obviously this is only being delivered in uh, very few schools at the moment. How would you enthuse and encourage teachers um, to, to be like uh, but Mr. Peebles, is it? I can't see your name. Mr. Peebles, um, what would you say to them? And how would you say, come on, you can do this too? Ellie, you have a... Um, like, I would say to them that it's quite good to know um the other kids should know it as well so it'd be quite good if you could teach them it and if you don't know it you could learn it as well okay what would you say millie to other teachers um i think if they see how useful it is then they will want to do it like just if they see 
Like, because if you know it, then you could save a life. I think if they know that, then they would want to do it. Okay. I feel because I have been through a lot of the schools to recruit the kids, speaking to teachers face to face, they are really up for it. And a lot of the teachers do have first aid background, whether that's just the basics to help out just in case. But every single teacher that I've spoke to is really just wants this to happen. And they, I feel like once it does happen, a lot of the other schools will be like, yes, we want to get involved. Cause, and at the end of the day, it is a great thing to know and you will help people. So I thank you. Thank you. Um, David Turns. Um, and can I put on record, in my eight years in Parliament and committee, that is probably the best start to any committee I've been on. <laughs> and thank you to Ellie and Millie for um, their confidence in telling me what I was doing wrong with CPR there, <laughs> <laughs> as my 29% showed. <laughs> um, you say that um, first aid is a life skill and something you'll take forward in later life and a benefit to your communities. How can we achieve an... Uh, encourage communities to take up first aid skills? Or, I can only speak, again, I can only speak for my own school, but we have actively gone to local businesses. We've contacted local parents and asked them to come in. We have a, a whole programme, as I said earlier, of life skills, of which first aid is just one. And we have uh, links with local parents who have come in, uh, one who's a doctor who's come in and taught EpiPen training to the entire staff. We have parents that come in as doctors and nurses and first aiders and deliver some of these lessons for us. So we'll do CPR, we'll show the kids bandaging much better than we can, in fairness. And it actually really does improve your links with, with parents and parents will then get more involved in the life of the school. And we've certainly found that parental and community um, working with us has increased through this programme that we've implemented. I think this is an area where the concept of um, community hub schools has a, a useful contribution to make as well. It's uh, been piloted in various local authority areas as a, a centre, you know, the school is a centre of education and information yeah. for the whole community. To add on to that, we, we actually will run courses after school for parents of um, um, less able or, le or more deprived children in the life skills that we've been teaching their children as well. I think one would make mention of another initiative which we are currently uh, beginning to work on with colleagues in the British Red Cross and Scottish Ambulance Service, um, which is to look at a, a joint uh, community resilience programme, um, which would be to bring all the different initiatives of this sort and others, community first responder schemes, um, our volunteers, the respective volunteers, to provide some uh, falls clinic, for example, something which colleagues in Wales have, have piloted volunteers who are ready and available at short notice to uh, to go out to help um, someone in that situation to take some of the pressures off the emergency services. And I think this is um, it's a separate but very interesting initiative and another example I think of how building from this base block um, you could actually take these skills and knowledge uh, and a contribution to making communities generally more resilient and safer to quite a wide extent. <laughs> I just see the way I'd go. Okay, no? okay. Um, in your uh, petition, it notes that St Andrew's First Aid trains thousands of people in life-saving skills um, across a wide range of different age groups. Can you give some examples of that and maybe expand on your bandage programme? Would you talk? <coughs> yep. So, uh, I. Uh, delivered the bandage project myself across the schools in Glasgow. So that was started in 2015. It is still running currently just now. Um, it ran across four schools initially in Glasgow, which were St Rock's, Springburn Academy, Clevedon and St um, John Paul Academy. And they 
did it for a couple of years, so basically we taught the full of third year in the emergency first aid course, the same as Joanne's staff, so the exact same course. And from that, we also taught them in a peer element. So basically, we didn't know, again, everything comes down to funding for ourselves also, so we didn't know how long we were going to be able to keep up going into the schools. So we wanted to make sure we were making the schools resilient and sustainable and carrying on. So we developed a peer education programme as well. So the kids who then had their basic first aid training were then given training in the peer element, which then enabled them to cascade their skills to the rest of the kids within their schools, which also then went on to the feeder primary schools in the area and also parents' evenings and first year days, that kind of thing as well. Now, I do have a couple of story, success stories from that as well. So, in 2015, in St Rocks, um, there was a teacher that came into the training with us as well. So, a teacher came in and we then had pupils obviously fill up the rest of the spaces. A couple of months after the first aid training, we received a call that somebody in the school had taken a heart attack. It was a pupil who had taken a heart attack. But the symptoms, and again, unless you've done the training, you've been lucky enough to go and do it, you don't always know the symptoms that aren't the ones that just stick out. So this young girl at the time, it was severe indigestion that she was feeling and she just had slight pains, but the pains were in her shoulders and that kind of thing. Now, a lot of people were saying, oh, just sit down, just have a glass of water, you'll be okay. The teacher and one of the pupils that had been on the first aid course stay, knew straight away that these were symptoms of a heart attack. They knew straight away that it was a cardiac problem, just simply because it had gone through the training that we had did. They knew that these symptoms were more in line with something like that because of the persistence of the symptoms. They saved that wee girl's life because she got straight to hospital. They treated her for a heart attack, got her straight to hospital, and she had no long-lasting damage from that. And that was just from a four-hour training course in basic first aid. The same year, in um, Clevedon Secondary, I dealt with a couple of pupils, and one of the pupils, he did the first aid and the peer element, and he suffered himself with diabetes, and he'd had it for years. It was type 1 diabetes, so he'd had it from when he was very, very young, and he'd went through quite a lot of years of not managing it properly because he didn't quite have an understanding, although it was himself, the condition, but he was young. He would even come up after PE to my classes, and you knew he had been overdoing it because he would come up and you could see him having symptoms of going into hypoglycemic attacks. Once we went through that part of the training, he started to understand more, and this is to touch on what Stuart said about the consequences. Obviously, he had the condition. He knew his condition better than anybody, obviously, but he didn't necessarily know what was always going on inside his body with that and what the consequences of that were. Through doing that training, he then was able to manage his condition much better. And I then worked with him for a few years because the peers in Clevedon were absolutely fantastic and they worked in their local communities all the time. He was able to live a far better life after that because he understood the consequences simply from doing a diabetes section with us. The third one, uh, this story, some of you might know this one. This was in 2016, but it was also someone who came from the Bandage programme. His name was David Corrigan, and he actually ended up going on um, to win the Brave at Heart Award. Now, David had done his basic first aid training with myself, and two weeks later, a similar story to Rebecca's, two weeks later, he'd been walking down Argyle Street, and a man got hit by a bus in front of him. And again, it was cool, confident, collected, because he had just done the training. Again, a four-hour course, that was all it was. So that's far more than we are now proposing as well. It's a far less time commitment we're now proposing. But he had done a four-hour course. Again, he was able to then get that man into a safe position. He used his initiative to go into the shops round about and get white roll, things like that, because you're not always going to go about with a first aid box. But he knew how to equate that to what would be in a first aid box. He stopped all the bleeding, got the man into recovery position, got an ambulance, saved his life. All simply by doing the bandage project that we provided. But again, we were only able to get into four schools with that. And that's why we started looking at this proposal. We wanted that every single child in Scotland has got access to what we've already given to these four schools that we've been in, but we need help to do that. So we have the first aid knowledge and we have all these great stories. I am very lucky to have worked with all these children. It gives me just as much joy as it gives them. And we are lucky to do that, but we now are at a position where we have the expertise there and we now need help to be able to roll that out right across. We, uh, 
St. Andrews is very proud of the efforts of our volunteers around the country, um, of our staff uh, in, and our community projects. In our workplace uh, training, social enterprise, which trains something like 15 to 20,000 people every year. Um, and the Bandage programme, as Francis described, it was great, but its impact we want to see. This is, was not really about the cost. There are some really strong arguments for doing this through schools rather than charitable endeavour. Uh, the first, and my partner's a teacher, so she probably prompted me to say this, is that teachers are role models for young kids. They will learn more effectively from teachers. It's just going to be easier to organise first aid training as part of the curriculum if it's done naturally and organically um, through the staff than to have organisations like St Andrews or British Heart Foundation or anyone else come from outside. That is a difficult thing, I'm sure Colin would agree, to organise into the, to the school day, as well as the, the time and you know, how would we roll it out that way. Um, but I think that in terms of long-term investment, there is international research evidence which supports that pupils just retain more of the knowledge if it comes from the teachers. Teachers are the best people to pass this information on. Uh, and another study that uh, I would cite was uh, found in 2012, I think, that after just one training session, four-hour training session, as uh, Francis has described, for teachers, uh, those teachers were able to demonstrate CPR in schools as effectively, if not more effectively, than medical professionals who had been brought in to do the same thing. So this is the way ahead in terms of the impact for Scotland as a whole. What would be the pupil commitment in the programme that you suggest? Because clearly the young people have got an interest in go and they, and they develop further skills and they do learn a lot from that. But the very basic in terms of this proposal, how much time would it be per pupil in the school? I think that's some, I would maybe throw that over to, to Colin. I think you mentioned about 12 hours uh, in your programme, but we, we would be flexible. This is somewhere where we would actually listen to teachers themselves in designing a, a programme. I think it could be done um, going through the school progressively. It could be done with as little as one or two hours a year, um, or it could be done more intensively. But we would listen to professionals like Colin. So I'll, I'll get, ask him. I think it's down to the individual, not only the individual teachers, but the individual school and how they could see it integrating into the teacher's workload already. Yes, we do more, um, and we do it in six-week blocks. So we have a six-week block of a certain amount of pupils will have first aid training. Other pupils in the school will be getting something else at the same time, and they rotate throughout the school year. So everyone gets it during the school year. I would also probably include that though, yes, the first aid training is a health and well-being outcome, but this type of thing can be linked into numeracy. You can do surveys on what do we think about first aid. You can link it into technology, which we quite often do. We get the pupils to make small infomercials with the iPads or other technology we've got in the school. It's also really good for things like role play 999 calls, actually doing the 999 calls, and that can be as low down as nursery and primary one. There's great examples on the internet. Uh, there's one in particular of a five-year-old girl who makes an emergency call and directs an ambulance into her mother who has had an epileptic seizure and has fallen down the stairs as an unconscious. So, and One of the things that strikes me is that um, we had a petition not that long ago from a family who lost their child because nobody knew where the defibrillator was. And it all felt of a part that it's like people not having confidence. There is support there, but having the confidence to make that intervention at an early stage. And certainly, I mean, it was mentioned about the excellent St Andrew's first aid training that um, I and my staff got. That what I reflected on there was certainly in my working life, there was the first aider. They were named or on a poster somewhere. And you think, well, why would you have a poster with somebody's name on it? You've then got to go and find them and maybe be better if we all knew. Um, and in terms, again, of the stories that have been heard, I think that's really important. Can I ask one last question? And I'm just going to ask you if you want to think, if there's one last thing you want to say to the committee before we um, kind of come to conclusion, if there's one more thing that you want to say. But can we ask Stuart, you may have referred to this in your statement, but just to confirm, where are we in international terms, in terms of scale of, um, or the level of training in first aid and not just CPR? Because I think you make that it's a very important point, I think, that you, um, that broader need for first aid rather than just CPR. Where are we internationally? I think the honest answer is that more evidence and research is required 
Um, the way of collecting official statistics, for example, varies from country to country, so making international comparisons is not always as easy as it might be. There is a general lack of um, research on this topic, which should really be addressed. That said, the evidence that does exist suggests that Scotland has been uh, poor by European standards, close to the bottom of league tables for bystander interventions, um, first aid training, number of current first aiders, uh, you know, people who have trained within the last three years and the like. Although, in fairness, it is improving. Initiatives such as the out of hospital cardiac arrest strategy uh, with the caveat about the way in which statistics are collected um, definitely show that initiatives of this sort are moving the dial in the right direction. Uh, and here is an opportunity, I think, to see significant improvements uh, internationally. I cited the study in Denmark. There are others in, in uh, the province of Pavia in Italy where, again, uh, instituting a primary school's training program had knock-on benefits for that city compared with surrounding areas which didn't have it because kids tell others and people, it demystifies the, the whole experience. So uh, uh, we are not... Uh, we stand very poorly compared with somewhere like Norway, forgive the, all the, the, the standard comparison in this place, uh, where about 90% of people are trained in first aid. But that didn't happen overnight. Um, measures of this sort would move Scotland to similar levels in a relatively short space of time. A couple of Brian, parliaments. you're wanting to come in. Okay, yeah, I mean, you're, you're here because uh, this is it's not the norm to have uh, this type of training uh, for for young uh, for young people, can I probably France is probably the best answer. So where's the, where's the resistance coming from then? If if, uh, if if you're not able to roll this out the way you want to, there's not necessarily resistance. It's a lot of it's down to funding a lot of the time. So schools obviously again have big pressures on them already for where their budget goes. We. Don't get in. We have to apply for funding to be able to provide this kind of thing. So the bandage project was funded, and it's been funded every year that we've ran it from outside funders. So therefore, within that funding, we don't have open-ended amounts of money. We can then roll it out into every single school. It's all costed up for a certain amount of schools. We've then always went towards the schools with the higher in the higher areas of deprivation because, as we've already alluded to. Those are the areas that they perhaps wouldn't be able to access it in other ways and are probably more likely to go and something to happen out in the street. So we've had to go down that route. I'm pretty sure if there was funding available that every school would want this kind of thing to be in their school, but it's down to a lack of funding and also down to a lack of, as we've already said, Colin's been able to do it in his school and they've been able to fit it in, but a lot of the time teachers think straight away that it's going to get forced upon them and it's something else they're going to have to add to their already existing pretty heavy workload that they've got. Whereas we want to make sure that they know that we want to work with them and make this as easy as possible for them. But again, it then comes down to us being able to have the funding to go in there. So I wouldn't necessarily say there is resistance. It's just there's goalposts that we can't get past because of funding issues. We, we did approach um, the minister at the time, um, Mrs Campbell, um, whose response on behalf of the Scottish Government was to acknowledge our efforts and to refer to uh, the work being done by Save a Life for Scotland and the Out of Hospital Cardiac Arrest Strategy and others. But as I've already emphasised, vital though a knowledge of CPR is, there are many other common emergencies, possibly even more common emergencies, where having the same basic level of understanding will help to save lives. So CPR, great. For a full first aid program, even better. And and it isn't about the cost. I think Francis is right. We perhaps are thinking, well, you know, teachers just don't want yet another mandated thing. Um, and it's not appropriate in Scotland in any case, because that's not how our curriculum works. But we have, from the outset, not sought to use anything along the lines of compulsion or mandating the teaching and so forth. I think that the, the, it's more important that we bring teachers along with us, that we make it easy for them. I'm absolutely certain that the teaching profession would be on board with it when they realise, or if they're assisted, um, to realise that this is really not nothing too difficult. We're making it easy, it's an important skill. I, I, I feel that the, 
I'm not absolutely sure whether there are any real barriers to the implementation of this measure. I can't think of any compelling reason, given that we're not talking about a huge amount of money here. Um, but of course, if there are others we haven't thought of yet, I'd be more than happy to address those. Okay, Rachel Hamilton? Well, just a short question on that. Uh, do you believe it uh, lies with the role of the Director of Education within the local authorities to um, influence what is in the curriculum? It, it absolutely does, of course, and, and I think we recognise that, but feel that um, there is scope for a stronger steer on this, because otherwise we will be left with the situation where some children in some areas will learn first aid or have the opportunity to learn, and others may never come across it in their entire school career. And I don't think it should be left to such a patchwork. And approach. my last point on your um, the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest strategy, which, of course, concludes in 2020. Yes. Um, I think there's room for a refresh of that if the government want to see an additional half a million people trained in, in CPR training. I think the, the, the strategy has been effective. There are other measures uh, that could be taken. I would maybe just touch, as my final contribution, on the petition by Jaden's Rainbow, which I think the convener was referring to. We have met with uh, Ms Ora and her family and with Stuart McMillan, MSP, um, to learn more about their work. Um, we absolutely want to assist them to take that forward. Uh, and again, I've written to, to, to Ms Ora on behalf of the charity recently to suggest that uh, we would like to meet with all the relevant partner, parties in the area, the local authority, uh, the MSP, uh, and work with that local charity. We can assist with our volunteers, um, with defibrillators which we have, which are still serviceable, have been used by volunteers, but are being replaced by newer models. They're, I'd like to work with the ambulance service to implement our public access defibrillation strategy in that council area, in support of that charity. I think if everyone were to work together, particularly the ambulance service needs to provide some guidance as to where the most effective place to put these is, and we will do everything that we can to support those efforts and to work in partnership. Okay, thanks very much for that. Now, I did see I promised if somebody wants to see one last thing um, before we, we think about what we're going to do with the petition, I'm happy to hear from you. It's not compulsory, but if you've got something, one last thing you wanted to say. Not enough convenient, but could I maybe start <laughs> I was maybe two, excluding you Is there you anything that? that our young, youngest first aidist, this morning anyway, would like to say about how, you know, what first aid has meant to you? Why do you enjoy doing it? Um, I, think I'm just, I think I just enjoy it because you get to help people. Um, you get to meet new people. Um, I think that's it. I think I just enjoy it. <laughs> Rebecca? Uh, yeah, I started when I was 10 doing first aid. So I was still in primary when I was doing it. And with my company, the Stanley company, it feels like a family with us because we're so used to each other. We bounce off each other, we're there to help. So I have actually now, I'm at City Glasgow College. I am doing a child health and social care course and I would like to be a child's nurse when I leave college and university and that's all down to first aid because it started off as a hobby going every Thursday night for an hour or so to talk the basics and now that I'm actually helping teach kids it's made me that's what I want to do is my job so I feel getting that is it's just made me what who I, who I am and what I want to do, so, yeah. Francis or Colton? I wonder if you want to say one last thing. If I could just say one thing briefly. First aid is a skill that we want to teach, but what we want to create is confident and supported and resilient young people. And I think our young people always have a lot of pressure on them, but more and more we're seeing that a lot of them are perhaps struggling in different areas of their life. And I think as society, we all have a responsibility to give these kids as many skills as possible, to give them the confidence to be all round individuals. And that's what we want to do. That's our end point. First aid's a skill, but we want to support the young people across Scotland to be resilient in themselves. Yeah. Okay. Colin? 
I, I would echo that entirely. The four, the four capacities talk about successful learners, responsible citizens, confident individuals, and effective contributors. I think First Aid sums that up. Yeah. Can I just say that if there was an, ever an example in front of us of the confidence that's given um, to young people who do First Aid, we've got three fantastic young people here who display a degree of confidence and calmness at a committee that quite often <laughs> older and um, uh, witnesses don't display. So I mean, really, I mean, it's just a living example of that, that um, it's, it's more than just the bandages, really. Um, I think we've learned a huge amount from it. And I think, certainly in my view, one of the comments is made about mental health first aid, the idea that you could encourage a young person to support their pal when they may be feeling a wee bit distressed is something I think that we would also, it's the kind of thing we would also want to be able to do. So we have to think now about what we want to do with the petition. I think, if I'm right, did we already write to the Scottish Government? So we've written up to the Scottish Government and we're waiting a response from them. I would be interested in what the teaching unions um, think. You've obviously referred to other people, who, and I, I, I'm very pleased that you've been in contact with um, the, uh, the petitioners and, and with Stuart McMillan and trying to be practical in support of that. But, other charities and organisations have an interest, I think we would also want to hear from. David? I'd like to write to the 30 local authorities to see if they have uh, what the barriers are to putting it into mm -hmm. their curriculum for excellence. So yeah. we've already... It sorry, depends on how many responses... Uh, we've we'll already written to the local authorities, but I think we would want to underline to them, and I think probably to cause that we would be interested. Is this something they're interested in? What would be the barriers for them delivering it? Because I think um, the point that Francis made is not necessarily there's resistance, but there are problems, so you know, we may be pushing an open door and not really understanding what the challenges might be. Brian? Can I just echo your comments, uh, convener, around not just the fact that it's a, a, a life skill, that uh, it's, it's looking at the confidence uh, of, of the, the young people in here today, or credit to yourselves. Um, and uh, as you know, I, I am an advocate of... of, of uh, allowing access to learning outside of the norm, whether that be this or sport or art or music or drama, but in this particular instance, they can save somebody else's life. Um, I think um, it's very compelling, the evidence that you've given. Um, and But one of the things that strikes me is there's one or two uh, other uh, petitions in, in, that are, that are, that are um, floating around that are in this arena. And I'm wondering whether or not we can... We can Stop, maybe pull that together in terms of uh, that, pe that piece of work. Angus? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think uh, given the, the information that we've received um, this morning from Stuart uh, and also in the submission, uh, the original submission with regard to the situation in Denmark um, and possibly Italy and Germany, I'd be keen to get, if we can, get a spice paper uh, on um, exactly how it's been rolled out in Denmark and I think you mentioned Norway as well. So all these uh, uh, you know, th these examples would be good to, to, to have a look at. And can I, can I just say, uh, it's not the norm or protocol in uh, this committee to applaud the <laughs> the, um, the, the, the the panel, but uh, I had to uh, avoid the urge to applaud when, when, uh, when you were all giving evidence today. Yeah. I wouldn't have given you a row if you had applauded <laughs> for once in your life. <laughs> um, is it Rachel? Uh, I think it would be worthwhile asking the Scottish Government um, what, is, what are their intentions for the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest strategy um, and whether this could be part of that ambition because, you know, getting an additional half a million people trained in CPR is very much part of uh, what these young people and uh, St Andrews are doing. Um, I also wondered whether it would be worth uh, writing to the Minister, Joe Fitzpatrick, um, in terms of public health, the preventative agenda here, um, and whether there was uh, any way that th this could be promoted as, as good practice. What we can certainly do is, as I said, we've been in contact already since the first hearing of the, of the petition um, with the Scottish Government. We want to flag up to them the evidence of the official report and ask them to have a look at that because I think there's a straight health dimension and there's a public health dimension to it. The thing that I find most compelling around the, um, the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest strategy is that you're more likely to have a heart attack, as we said at the beginning, and less likely to get help 
um, if you're living in, in, a, in a less privileged area. And I think that just, in terms of just fairness and justice, that can't be right either, that you're less likely to have somebody around about you to help you. But also I think the point I find very powerful that um, it can't just be about CPR. It must be about that, but it can't just be about that because there are other things that have we seen already, the responses that the, the young people have made have been to all sorts of different incidents that some of us would have stepped back from. So I think what we would want to do is to reflect on the written submissions um, at a future meeting, perhaps flag up to SPICE. We'd be interested in some of these um, international comparators. If we haven't already done so, to make contact with the teaching unions to see if there's actually a resistance there. My own sense would be the resistance will be if it's simply creating extra work and expectation without actually the support that's underpinning it. Um, and I think we would want, I certainly would be very interested in hearing from um, the Scottish Government round how this kind of approach is a practical delivery of, of some of their policies. Is there anything else we can usefully do? I think that's, um, um, I think we certainly would want to reflect on the evidence that we've heard. There's a whole number of strands there, and I'm very aware that you know, you, it may have prompted you in terms of some of the other things that you're doing. So if there was other things that you wanted to flag up to us that you thought would be useful to our consideration, please feel free um, to come back to us. But I think I speak for everybody on the panel. We want to thank you all very much for the evidence you've given today. It's been um, very thought-provoking, very interesting, and certainly in the pre, but very entertaining as well, which is it's also a novelty, um, but I want to thank you all very much for your attendance. I'm going to suspend briefly to allow the, um, you to move away and then we'll go on with the rest of the business, but thank you very much again.
Okay, if I can um, call the meeting back to order. Um, the next petition is petition 1551, lodged by Scott Pattinson on mandatory reporting of child abuse. The briefing paper sets out the background and previous actions in this petition. The committee agreed in December 2015 that it would wait for the UK government to consult and for the Scottish government to respond to that consultation. A summary of that consultation in the UK government action was published in March 2018. The Minister for Children and Young People wrote to the committee in October 2018 to advise the committee that as things currently stand, the Scottish Government will not introduce legislation making mandatory reporting a legal requirement. There are a number of reasons for this, including that, following consideration of the evidence and views raised in the consultation, it agrees that the case for a mandatory reporting duty or duty to act has not been made. This appears to echo the content of submissions that this committee received. The majority of organisations that provided submissions did not appear supportive of mandatory reporting, citing concerns that a move towards mandatory reporting may have significant unintended consequences and that the current legislation should be given time to bed in and also be used to its full extent. The petitioner has responded to the committee. He makes some observations in his submission, but also states that this is his final submission. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I suppose one thing I would want to say in this context, I think a lot of work has been taken forward around um, trying to understand the impact on survivors of abuse and supporting survivors. The inquiry, obviously, into child abuse is part of that, but there are broader issues for um, those who have been, been abused, abused in a family setting. And so I think we have to decide whether this proposal helps that or does it make a difference rather than saying is this the way in which we simply support survivors we wouldn't want people to think that because we didn't necessarily support this petition that we don't have a, a recognition of the the, um, the terrible challenges that, that survivors of abuse um, still live with often into adulthood but i was very struck by the fact that um that there's such a wide range of people didn't feel that this particular approach and mandatory um, reporting was going to help. I wonder if others have comments to make. Brian? I think, that, I think this, you know, this petition, this petition raises quite a lot of uncomfortable considerations. I mean, the first thing that struck me when, when this petition came along was why, why on earth would you not report uh, or intervene uh, in, 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 child, uh, in child abuse? As you, as you alluded to, it can be in a lot of a lot of child abuse happens within uh, a, a family setting. Um, I have to say, I, I, <coughs> with you, I am I am I am. Uh, I'm, first of all, I was surprised, but then when reading through it, re recognising that the majority of people who of organisations who submitted to this petition didn't think mandatory reporting was was the way to go. Um, and, the, and as you've alluded, there's, there's, other, there's a lot of work going on, and we've done a lot of work just within this committee on this particular uh, uh, issue and surrounding issues. So I, I've got to say that, that uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure we can go any further with this particular petition. Uh, that's my, my gut feel just now. I did note from the um, Minister for Children and Young People submission in October 2018, they say that officials will continue to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of the Scottish child protection system, working closely with stakeholders and any relevant UK government officials, which also gave me some um, confidence that it wasn't simply saying, you know, this is not an issue for us, but they recognise they must constantly be open to um, ways in which they can make sure the child protection system is effective. Angus? Yeah, I would I would uh, echo that, convener, and I, I think the salient point in the, the Scottish government's response in October was that they they, they feel there's not a compelling uh, argument for mandatory re reporting at the, at this time. So um, I, I think um, there's also a strong argument to allow the, the current legislation to to bed in. Um, so I think. I don't, I don't see how we can take this petition any further at the moment, given the responses that, that we've received. Okay. Anyone else? No. I wonder then, for are we suggesting that we would close the petition, recognising that the petitioner can, of course, petition the committee again at a later stage, um, but um, 
in closing the petition, we would be recognising that the Scottish Government itself has said it's involved in a great deal of, of um, activity around this area, but that they have committed to continuing to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of the child protection system. So are we agreeing that we would close the petition under Rule 15.7 of standing orders on the basis that there does not appear to be any support for the action called for in the petition, but that there are... Um, there is evidence, clear evidence, that there's a recognition across the Parliament far beyond of the importance of being alive to the, the, the issues around child abuse and the, 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 and the need for a robust child protection system. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay. In that case, if we can move on. The next petition is Petition 1595 by Sandy Taylor on a moratorium on shared space schemes. The committee last considered this petition in September 2017. The committee noted the outcome of, of a seminar on shared space schemes and anticipated that the petitioner would take part in a working group in relation to findings in the seminar report. The petitioner in his latest submission reports that he's had difficulty in arranging a meeting um, that he would like to have with the Minister for Older People and Equalities, and he says he is concerned about responses received from Transport Scotland. He points to the UK Government guidance note on using shared space to improve high streets for pedestrians, which has been temporarily withdrawn for updating, suggests that, in his opinion, the Scottish Government should take similar action, and that he understands that schemes are currently under construction in Scotland. And I should say that um, Rona Mackay, who um, was a member of this committee, was unable to be here today, but she obviously was very aware um, of the issues highlighted by the petitioner as he was a constituent of hers. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Um, well, it, it's interesting to note uh, in, in the briefing papers that the, the UK Department for a transport has recommended that local authorities pause the development of uh, shared spaces schemes while uh, they review and update uh, their, their guidance. Um, <clears throat> so, given the situation south of the border, it, it may be uh, worthwhile writing to the Scottish Government once again to to ask if it still uh, holds its, its previous view that the a decision on, on shared spaces is very much a, an issue for, for the local authorities rather than a national government. Um, I also note the petitioner's point that he's, uh, he, he's, he's approached uh, this issue on a national basis rather than uh, just a local basis, which was highlighted to us when the petition uh, came to us at, at the start. Um, and also that it's it's uh, it's an issue of equality and, and human rights, uh, and I'm uh, slightly surprised that uh, despite the the best efforts of the, the petitioner and um, the MSP Rona Mackay, uh, they haven't managed to secure a meeting with the Minister for Older People and Equalities. Um, I would have expected uh, that that would have been. Um, you know, a, a route that everyone would expect them to go down to, 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 to raise the issue. So um, there's maybe some way that we could encourage the minister to meet with the petitioner uh, in the hope that uh, um, the, 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 the whole shared spaces issue can be, can be looked at, um, yeah. not, not just on an inequalities issue, but uh, on a planning issue as well. Yeah. I mean, certainly from my recollection, there was a sense in which the message of come back from government was they did want to engage with the issues that the petitioner had raised and that he should be involved in um, a working group, I think it is reflected, but we maybe try to establish that. But certainly, I think the point you make about um, the Minister for Older People and Equality is perhaps being aware of why this matters so much for particular groups, because it feels like, oh, well, it's just a planning issue, but as we discovered... There's actually there, there, there was an equality dimension to it that perhaps we wouldn't have thought of if it hadn't been for um, the petitioner. Um, Brian? I would um, uh, agree with, uh, with Angus MacDonald. I think that um, it's, uh, although the, the planning obviously the planning is part of the issue, the real issue is, is anybody being excluded uh, from these areas, which is, um, which is exactly the opposite of what, what they're designed, designed to do. And I think that... Um, uh, encouraging the minister to at least hear uh, hear the petitioner out, uh, I think it's something. Given given that this petition has been sitting in here uh, for some time, I, I think it would give it some sort of weight and credibility. Okay, I mean, certainly my sense was that 
um, the shared seminar, the seminar on it, and the Minister of Transport, when he was in, was quite positive about trying to respond to the issues that were being highlighted. Um, at UK level, they're obviously updating their guidance. They've seen that there's an issue there. We want to clarify with the Scottish Government, again, just what their position is. Are they, uh, is it that they don't have a role at all, but it's up to each individual local authority, or is there guidance that's going to go out um, and perhaps reflect in this question about the usefulness of, of engaging with a petition, I think, would be helpful. So is that agreed, Rachel? Has there been any indication um, that the petitioner will be included within the working group, or is it an invitation? And, well, my sense is that what the Scottish Government is now seeing is it's a matter for local authorities, but um, perhaps that's something we could usefully ask as well. Because it may not have been that it was the intention to engage the petitioner directly with the minister. I can understand that. But if there was a group who had an interest in the field and he was, my sense in the past was that it was an expectation he might be involved with, that might have been um, simply misunderstand my part, but that would be worthwhile clarifying, I think. OK, if that's agreed. So um, we will um, write to the Scottish Government just to clarify its view on um, its role in relation to shared spaces, a suggestion we think that would be useful for the Minister, um, if at all possible, and we recognise the constraints on, on her time to meet with the petitioner, but certainly some clarity on how they see the petitioner being part of, of the work going forward. Um, and if that's agreed, we can move to the next petition, which is petition 1640, lodged by Eileen Bryant, calling for action against irresponsible dog breeding. We took evidence in this petition last year from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, during which he highlighted a number of initiatives and other measures, including consultations, which were being taken forward to address the concerns and issues raised in the petition. We invited the petitioner to respond to the evidence, but unfortunately a submission has not been received. The clerk's note advises that the government is expected to report shortly on its consultation in dog, cat and rabbit breeding activities. The note also refers to Christine Graham's final proposal for a responsible breeding and ownership of dogs Scotland Bill. The final proposal has secured the required number of supporters. I understand the current number is about 32 from across the parties represented in the Parliamentary Bureau in order to allow it to proceed as a member's bill. Members will be aware that this is subject to the Scottish Government advising whether it intends to bring forward legislation in the same or similar terms. The Government must provide any such notification by the end of this month. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I should declare that I'm one of the 32 that signed and, and supported uh, Christine Graham's proposal for the Responsible Breeding and Ownership of Dogs Scotland Bill. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say, Convener, that the, the petition's done its job um, and uh, the bill proposed by Christine Graham covers the issues that are specifically raised in, in this petition uh, and we'll hopefully see the, the bill progress soon. Um, uh, so, well done to uh, Aileen Bryant, the petitioner. Okay, any other, so, you'd be suggesting that we close um, the petition? I would suggest that we close the petition, given uh, you know things have moved on significantly since it was submitted. Okay. Anyone else? hands of the government uh, to perhaps bring forward legislation and consider the areas that the petitioner had um, actually brought forward. So, I do feel that um, perhaps that will move quicker than perhaps... The, the, this, co this uh, committee could do. So I, I agree with closing the petition. David? I'm supportive of it, and I'm one of the ones that have signed it as well. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. yep. So we're agreeing that we would uh, close the petition understanding order 15.7 on the basis that the Scottish Government and other agencies continue to take forward a range of measures to address the issues raised in the petition and subject to any indication from the Scottish Government that intends to bring forward legislation the proposed Members Bill, recently lodged by Christine Graham, is expected to cover those areas of concern. So, in, in agreeing to close the petition, I think we should recognise that there has been progress, and I would certainly argue um, as a consequence of the work done by the petitioner herself. I want to thank her for um, bringing the petition forward and uh, um, note that the, this is one where I think the petition can be um, satisfied that it has come to a satisfactory conclusion. With that, can we move on to the final petition for consideration this morning, which is Petition 1651 by Marion Brown on behalf of Recovery and Renewal on Prescribed Drug Dependence and Withdrawal. And can I welcome um, Maurice Corey, uh, MSP, to the meeting for this item. 
Members of a note by the clerk, along with copies of recent submissions that were not publicly available at the time of the meeting papers being issued, but which are now online. As I've stated previously, it's not always possible for the clerks to review, process and publish written submissions at the time meeting papers are issued due to the significant volume of correspondence that is received, not just in relation to this particular petition, but also the other 70 to 80 petitions that are under the committee's consideration. The clerk's note refers to the Scottish Government's submission of December 2018, which states that the Chief Medical Officer has established a short-life working group on prescription medicine dependence and withdrawal. It is anticipated that the group will meet three to four times and is expected to report its findings in the second half of this year. Members will see that in her most recent submission, the petitioner has requested expressly that, quote, the full evidence of this petition be taken into account by the Short Life Working Group as formal evidence of experts by experience. That is something highlighted in the Scottish Government's submission as being a specific focus of the Short Life Working Group. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. And what I might do is ask Maurice Corry if he wants to make a contribution first. Yes, thank you, Gabina. Um, do you want me to go now? Yes. yes, thank you very much indeed and uh, for having me here today to, to, to uh, talk on this. Um, can, obviously, I realise it's gone to the sort of like work, working group um, in relation to the next stage or rather the recommendations of this committee. Uh, but I have one concern um, and it's around psychotherapy uh, in relation to that. And, and also, um, can I ask the question, have any psychotherapy experts and patients been invited onto the short life working group or indeed attended meetings thereof? Well, that's not something I would know, but it's something that we can certainly ask. Therefore, I would suggest that might be considered, if I may f put that forward to you, Convener, to put to the Short Life Working Group on a recommendation. Can, perhaps for, for the record and to help us, why would you want to make that recommendation? Well, I think basically, uh, and this is my next point, if I may move on to that, um, surely it's absolutely vital that the voice of the patient and the analysis of personal accounts of prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal uh, submitted are submitted to the, uh, and as submitted to the uh, Public Petitions Committee, or if not so, um, it, and it was written in a report in October 2018, uh, that be taken into account um, it, without fail in relation to this whole matter. In other words, experience is what's happening. Um, because this provides all the evidence of actual patients' experiences uh, that when taking prescribed medication. Um, and I'm aware that uh, from psychotherapy uh, experts that veterans with PTSD, which I know quite a bit about on my side of the business, um, have been uh, put in similar courses of medication as described and have experienced terrible uh, consequences such as suicidal and homicidal tendencies. Um, and I know there is an example in this country, uh, Horses for Forces and the Borders, um, which actually uh, practice with psychotherapy and I've seen the results of that very positively. So I would ask that that may be considered um, but where you can, uh, if it's not too late, to put that forward to the, on your recommendations. I think we can certainly refer to the fact that you have um, made that request and, mm -hmm. that we, you, you, and the arguments for it. I think also the request from the petitioner that um, the evidence to this committee be forwarded is, is um, well, I'll take guidance from the clerks, but whether that would be permitted. But the, the, most of that's that's um, compliant with the law is on is in public view anyway, so that would be something that we could make available to the group so it'd be aware. But one of the things that's very clear from consideration of the petition is very, very strong feelings in this and very strong um, evidence of people's direct experience, which obviously um, it would be useful for the group to, to be aware to. They may be alive to it anyway, but it's certainly even just seeing the volume of it has its own impact. I think it's had an impact on the committee as a whole. Brian, yeah. sorry. Yeah, one thing is obviously the all-party parliamentary group, which is a report produced in August 2008, the patient's voice obviously is a very apposite on this particular subject. And I think it's something I presume has been taken into consideration, but something I certainly would, would, would commend to be followed up. And I think uh, also the, the question of alternative methods be considered. But certainly from the armed forces side, we've a lot of, very lot of experience have come from this. And we have seen the suicide rate, um, sadly, it's still not good, but it's certainly been looked at and obviously it's related in some cases to treatment and therefore we've seen it as I say with use of animals for example horses I've seen it with dogs and things like that and certainly very positive outcomes on it so I would commend and implore that state in consideration. Brian? I, I, would, um, I, I would echo um, the thoughts of, of Morris Corrie suggesting that uh, 
uh, the lived experience is hugely important to uh, this particular uh, party because I'm sure we all have um, constituents or people that we know uh, in this situation. And particularly, I'm looking at one where um, chronic pain um, required uh, or, or were prescribed drugs where they became addicted to those drugs, um, which changed behaviour to a point near suicide. Uh, that person decided to come off the drugs and was given no help whatsoever uh, to do that and, and was left to his own devices and is now left with, the, with either uh, being in chronic pain or being addicted to, to pain-killing drugs. And I think that, that, so that sort of stark evidence I think is really, really important uh, for this, this particular group to look at. So I would just like to echo uh, Maurice Corrie's uh, thoughts there. Okay. Rachel? I note from um, the, the clerk's notes here that the short life working group actually does have patient support community as well as clinical um, a, a cross section, a wide cross section um, of, of people involved. So whether we ask the Scottish Government if, as part of that, whether wh wh who is being considered with, as part of the community rather than the clinical uh, part of that working group. I mean, we've got the the, the note, um, and I, I, you know, people can see that it's in the public domain. Who's on on that group? I know that um, Irene Oldfather, um, her work around dementia has been very much led by experience and the experience of carers and and so on. So, but I wouldn't pretend to 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 note the others. But we can certainly flag up, I think, to the the this short life working group, um, the representations that have been made about the importance of those with that experience being, um, being heard in, in the process. Um, and in terms of what we would be doing around the petition, I think we would want to defer further consideration of the petition until after the Sort Life Working Group has reported its recommendations, um, which would then, I'm assuming again, be open for public response. Morris? Okay, can I give a quick, just final little bit? I think one of the things I've discovered, obviously looking into this, has been the fact of the relationship between the medical professions and their patients. And there is a sort of feeling of uh, they're, not being, they're not being believed, possibly, maybe stifling. I mean, it's something I think is, seems to be there, and that might reflect, and we've noticed a bit of this with the veteran side. Uh, and there's no disrespect to anybody, but I think there's maybe this question of understanding that and the communication between the two. So I, I would ask you maybe to pass that forward. This has been a theme, I think, in the in the committee's consideration of a number of petitions, whether it was in ME, whether it was in MESH, um, the extent to which there's maybe a gap between what clinicians believe is happening and what the direct experience is, and how you make sure, and it's not that they don't want to know about the direct experience, but they maybe are seeing it in different ways, and it's just recognising that it's important to reflect on, you know, and I think that's why it'd be useful for to highlight out the submissions we've received, Sim not just because their individual testimony is very powerful, but simply the volume of them is quite, is quite striking. And obviously, um, those engagements would have to make the balance um, and understand um, the different, all the different bits of it that they would need to reflect on. But, you know, stories of people who are uh, prescribed drugs and then that becomes more of a problem than the thing that was drugs were prescribed for is a challenge. So I think be, we would hope that the Short Life Working Group would be um, reflecting on that. Unless there's further um, some comments, I think we would want to, as we've agreed, defer further consideration of the petition until it's reported its recommendations, but highlight to the Short Life Working Group this conversation and the submissions that we have received in relation to what for a lot of people has been um, a very difficult and, and challenging issue. Okay. So if, that, if that's great, thank you very much, Maurice Corrie, for your attendance, um, and thank everyone else, and I'll close the meeting.